Hello, everybody. I'm Sharon Olson with PNAMP and USGS, and I'm glad we're getting so much participation in the data visualization work group. For those of you who haven't um, been with us before or very often, the first couple of meetings, we just sort of scoped what we wanted to do, what our goals might be, and whether we wanted a product from this, this group or not. And everybody came to a consensus that we really just wanted to learn from each other, and we wanted presentations to see what we were doing around the region, and we wanted to find out what data visualization tools are available. So basically, who's doing what? And that was what we decided was the main focus of the group, at least for now. We also decided that monthly meetings would be useful. There are a lot of presentations we, we could have. We started with two presentations in one meeting, and that seemed to be too many for an hour. So people ask for an hour and a half and they ask for one presentation per meeting. And that might change depending on the types of presentations we have later or any feedback I get from anyone. So that's our format, brief background. As far as announcements, I just wanted to let you all know or remind you that we do have a resource document it's in a Google Drive, and I also, from time to time, turn this into a PDF and post it on our PNAMP website. And the agenda always has the links to these, um, and this has information from all kinds of people. For instance, Mike Bannock showed us something about uh, how voter mapping can change depending on how you want to visualize proportions of voters. So please do contribute to this or send me information, links. Of course, we have a PNAMP area. It's under projects, data management, data visualization, and also our calendar has the meeting events, and we have a lot of documents um, attached to both our calendar meetings and to the project. So a lot of resources, we're starting to sort of build a library for a lot of resources for people to have, and you guys are helping us do that. I attend meetings every month. Uh, this is a group called Community for Data Integration, CDI. And CDI is a group from USGS. However, I think I sent you an email invitation to this particular meeting. The Community for Data Integration has presentations from all over the place, open to everybody. You don't have to be USGS. And there's a lot of information, a lot of special work groups. Um, the reason I sent you an invitation to this meeting is that there was a focus on data visualization at this meeting. And I am contacting Jordan Reed, and hopefully he'll be able to present our group, his presentation, which was really good, presentation about how to visualize hurricane effects and flooding, how to marshal the data in real time and get it out there to a lot of different audiences. So um, the person who manages this group is Leslie Hugh, and she says that everybody is welcome to attend these meetings. Um, so I recommend them if you're interested in anything having to do with data. I'll send you the link right now, and I'll also have it in the agenda. For you. Does anybody else have any announcements or thoughts? All right, then. What I'd like to do then is introduce Nancy Leonard from the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. And she's agreed to give us a presentation about what the council uses for data visualization. They've been working on this for a while, a number of years, and they've come up with um, a lot of ways to visualize different types of data to different audiences. So I'm really glad that Nancy wanted to show us what they've been up to. I know some of you have seen some of this. So I will turn this over to Nancy. Nancy, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And if you can share yours. Can you see mine? We can. We can see your presentation. It looks good. Okay, perfect. So far, it well, looks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see how, uh, how it goes from there. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, thank you for the invitation, and as you mentioned, uh, some of the tools I'll be showing today actually date back almost 15 years, so you're going to kind of see a, a different 
style as we go through the various tools and I'll try and highlight some of the things uh, that we're planning on doing with the tools in the upcoming couple of years. So uh, the other thing I should forewarn you about is that we do have a lot of tools. So this is all going to be a bit like a, a sampler of everything. And there's some web links included in the presentation so that you can dive in uh, at your leisure and, and always feel free to contact me for if you have any questions when you're exploring some of our tools. So to get started, I thought I would start off uh, a bit with a discussion about the drivers behind why the council staff has been developing these visual tools with the managers over the last uh, decade, and as well touch on the other items that uh, Sharon asked me to touch on, including our audiences, uh, the type of tools we have. I'm also going to take a, a few minutes and show you the development process and how much the tool uh, can change depending on the input you receive from your audience, and then wrap it up with some lessons learned. <clears throat> so the drivers behind why we've been uh, struggling with how we could improve our outreach and communication of information related to the Fish and Wildlife Program comes from the Northwest Power Act, which among many other things, also tells us that we're supposed to be engaging the Northwest citizen and educating them so that they can be an uh, informed participant to the program. Within our 2014 program, uh, we also have guidance in there that says that we're supposed to provide information so that we can have a good understanding of the status of the focal species, the focal species and habitat that have been impacted by the hydro system that the program uh, is tasked to mitigate with the recommendations we receive from the managers. And also to uh, provide information about how well the program is performing by sharing with the ratepayers and other participants and other interested parties information about the type of work we do and, and how that is uh, performing. <clears throat> As Sharon mentioned, uh, one of the complex things that we have uh, and trying to develop these visual tools is that we have a wide range of audiences and we're never quite sure who's going to pop up on which of our tools and they range from people that just have a generalized interest uh, as basic as trying to figure out why there's this thing called a council and what do they do uh, it can be students or any Northwest citizen then we also have some policy folks uh, that we target <clears throat> mainly our council members state governors and also some of the um, congressional folks that comes out uh, once a year to meet with us and to learn more about what's going on in the basin. We have the Science Advisory Board and the Science Review Panel. Uh, they're more, as you could guess it, more technical. They're science. Scientists from uh, around the North American area who uh, help us out by reviewing projects that get funded through the program as well as uh, reviewing topics of interest and of concern in the area. Sharon, do you hear some some static on the line or is it just on my end? I am hearing static occasionally. I think if everyone could mute their phones, it would be good. Okay. And then the, the last group of audience involves the Fish and Wildlife Managers who actually provide the recommendation that guide the type of work that gets done through the program as well as uh, performing the work that gets funded through Bonneville and other agencies. So it can be quite a mess. Uh, we can develop tools, but we never are quite sure who's gonna be trying to use it. Uh, we try and uh, target certain audiences during our development process just to keep it a bit more manageable on our end, but we still end up having a potential diverse group of audiences trying to utilize all the various tools that we've been developing. And what you see on the slide here, um, is those tools that I'll be discussing today, and they range from very technical bar graphs, not as technical as a true scientific peer-reviewed literature, but uh, relatively speaking, they're more technical, more uh, information dense, to less technical and completely non-technical, such as this top one that's still in development, the Explore Highlight tool, which focuses more on telling stories. So over the last decade or so, uh, we've, we've discovered that there's, there's a, almost like a five-phase approach to how we always tackle developing these tools. Um, the first phase always obviously is where you should always start off is getting an idea of who your audience is, what type of 
information you're trying to communicate with them, what you're trying to have them learn when they come to your tool. And then once we have an idea of the scope, roughly, we you know, go about compiling the content that we think we would want to include in the tool, and then we start engaging our audience, our council members, get an idea of do we have pretty much what we think is out there that we would want to include in the tool. In phase two is when we start um, mocking up what we think the tool might look like, what the output would look like. And this can become an iterative process that we might repeat more than once, where we'll mock up something, go out to our tar target audience, get their input, they get more creative, they realize what they could get out of this tool, and so we adjust the mock-up again, and then go back to them. And so it can take a couple uh, of cycles. But once we think we have a pretty good mock-up, which tends to be uh, something that we develop maybe on a PowerPoint slide just to show them how the information could look, then we develop a prototype tool. And the prototype tool is slightly more dynamic. It's, it's not fully functional. There's, you know, just a, it's like a, a small subset of the tool being fleshed out so that we can start sharing that with our tar target audience and they can play around with it and get a feel for what the experience is like as they're trying to navigate. And we find that when we give them this prototype tool, that's when they start getting even more questions in our mind going, oh, you know, I thought when I clicked here, this would happen, or why don't I get some background information on this to go with this information you're showing me? So it's still a, a pretty dynamic development phase, even though we're halfway through, through the um, development stages at phase three. <clears throat> so you still have to be pretty flexible and listen to what they're reacting to and trying to figure out what the underlying need that they're trying to uh, find in this tool. <clears throat> During phase four is when we're, we're done testing out the prototype tool. Uh, we may have done an additional cycle of the prototype tool depending on how uh, diverse the input was from the audience. But after that first phase, um, after that prototype tool, we tend to have a pretty good idea of what the audience is trying to do with the tool, what type of information they want and how to organize our underlying database to uh, support that tool from a user's endpoint. And so we developed the fully functional tool. But from what we've learned, even though we think we've heard and understood what the audience wants, uh, we don't completely stop uh, developing at that point. Uh, when we do have something that's fully functional, we then again go back to our audience, let them try it out, and usually there's some refinements, some great ideas that we can adjust. Uh, we limit the great ideas, though, at this stage. We can't completely redevelop from, from uh, scratch, but we try and figure out if there's some finer refinements we can make to um, better meet our audience's need. And then the last phase, once we actually have that functional tool, uh, one thing we've learned in recent years, given all the reduction in budget and uncertainty in future budget, is uh, we are trying more and more to develop tools that have a, an interface that council staff can access so that we can update any content that can become out of date and not have to rely to a third party and try and keep it simple enough of an interface that uh, as council staff change over time, uh, we'll still be able to manage it. It's not gonna require someone with any special expertise. So just to give you an idea of a tool we recently developed and how quickly it changed, uh, I just want to give, go over this uh, development process using the Fish Objective Story Map tool. And what we're going to look at is the phase that focus on salmon and steelhead natural origin abundance objectives. And we started this work in 2014. And as you can see on the left with the arrow, you know, it was, it was several years of development. You, know, you, you always think you're going to start something and it's going to go super quick because, hey, it's such a narrow focused topic. How long could it possibly take? Uh, so we started in 2014 following the guidance in the Fish and Wildlife Program, which directed us to work with others in the region to compile every existing objective for natural origin, adult salmon and steelhead abundance that we could find in the basin that was either related to Bonneville funded work through the program or completely unrelated. We just find it, compile it, and figure out a way that you can make that information accessible to others. So the first step we did is we compiled everything you could find, 
uh, we use uh, assistance from QW Consultant to help me out because we're quite a small staff here. So we can do this on our own in a timely manner. <clears throat> so we compile all the content. And our first phase was just put in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, a bunch of rows, really overwhelming. We had close to 3,000 uh, entries of different objectives, quantitative and qualitative, that we found for the five species of salmon. And we had a lot of numbers to play with. Before we went forward to develop a tool, uh, first thing we wanted to double check is did we find everything so that we have a good idea of the scope of variety of objectives. And then we decided to uh, do a quick mock-up. So the first version of the tool is what you see on your screen right now. It was you know, pretty basic looking. It allowed folks to pick a species, change their background a little bit. They could print what they view. But it was still pretty limited in what, how the information would be displayed. So we brought the content, this more basic tool, to two meetings in 2015 to get input from the fish and wildlife managers as well as our council members. We showed them we found a lot of objectives. And right now, with this very basic tool, if you want to view them, it's going to be a bit clunky because you have to scroll left and right to go through all the different objectives that exist in a given subbasin once you click on a subbasin on the map. And then you can get a slight overview of the range of numbers that we found. But then you basically keep on scrolling all the way down until you see all the various documents that have objectives, oh, sorry, I keep clicking, that have objectives um, related to selected species steelhead in the clear water subbasin. So it was pretty clunky and not that attractive, but it was a way to get started to get some input on what people thought uh, we should do with this, tom with this topic to make it more useful and how get them thinking about how they might want to interact with this information. So based on the input, we completely changed the way the tool looked. Uh, we developed a more interactive, more appealing looking and um, a tool that allowed more options for how the information would be displayed using the Esri story map. And this again is with the help of QW Consulting because we didn't just use a normal template from the Esri story map, uh, map gallery, but we actually had QW Consultant down, download the code behind these templates so they could customize the tool for us. So we met again with the managers and the council members in 2016. We showed them the new version of the tool, showed them how we had listened to them. They could now change the view by option so that they could uh, choose to view the objective in the database organized by subbasin which would be on the top right, where you have the view by option, or by major population group, or by population. Uh, we allowed them to uh, pick a species by clicking between tabs instead of the clunkier version on the previous version. And they also requested a, a bit more filtering ability, such as by being able to, once they pick a subbasin, let's say, or a major population group or something, they could then come to <clears throat> the tab of their choice, and then they could also narrow down and all, only see the fall Chinook or the spring summer Chinook instead of all Chinook uh, at one time. <clears throat> so we started modifying it. We also found out that when you provide the information in more easily to the user, it's a lot easier for them to start finding all those typos you missed the first time around. So you know, it gives you another way of double checking the accuracy of your content. So the way this new version worked is once they pick the view by subbasin or population, the species, if they filter by run, then they could either uh, display the content of information related to this, uh, in this case, the steelhead and the Lewis subbasin by either clicking the tile on the left or by clicking on the map. And then wherever they click, it would pop up a box of information. Now for this tool, for the FISH objective, we figure we probably would have the council members looking at this, some of the um, audiences, such as reporters, as well as the technical people. So this is one of the tools where we actually tried to meet multiple audiences, which is, as you can imagine, challenging. So what we did to try and keep the general audience out of the weed is that the first level information that would pop, pop up once they picked what they wanted to view, 
uh, steelhead in the Lewis Subbasin was a more simple uh, graphic uh, pop-up box that contained just a bit of information about what population they were looking at and a type of objective values they could find and a bit of information about whether that population was threatened or, or not listed. For the more technical audience, they could then click uh, the view more objective information, which then popped up a very dense box. So I figure a lot of people probably showed up here from the general audience and just backed out. And this box is where you could get all the nitty gritty detail. Uh, you could start seeing objective values that were targeting at the population scale, or you could click another tab and look at objective values targeting multiple populations together. Uh, when you did look at a given population, such as the East Fork Lewis River summer steelhead, <clears throat> you would get additional information about are there any alternate names being used for this population, um, what, if there's any ad adult abundance available for the current year would be shown, some other background information related to their listing, <clears throat> and then you would also see more details about the actual objective value associated with this population. For example, uh, the first row here shows that there are some uh, documents in the Lewis Subbasin that denote that a 500 natural origin salmon steelhead abundance is what would be needed to meet the minimum uh, level, the minimum abundance threshold. And then from this row, you could get more information about who created this objective, is it NIMF, some other entity, when was it created, um, what year was the, the objective published, and then you have a link to the actual source document. So you could read the objective within context. Once we had that level of um, the, you know, what we thought was going to be the final tool, we went back again to the managers and the council members in February 2017, showed them what it was, and then because they could finally interact quite a bit with this tool, they started thinking, well, how cool would it be if you could display uh, the abundance information for multiple years that's currently being shown on StreamNet coordinate assessment tool? So that's when we worked with StreamNet and basically created, um, I'll call it a web service, uh, I think that's what it's called, <clears throat> a way for people to not only just come to our site and view the objectives associated with the population, but we also redisplayed uh, the graphics from StreamNet and allowed the view, viewer, uh, the user to view both sides of the equation, the objective and what's going on with the population. And if they wanted to, they can you know, redirect and go stream that and explore more. So the tool changed quite a bit over time as the audience provided more input, saw uh, the mock-up, the prototype, and reacted to it. And then, of course, to end everything up, uh, we made sure to create that user interface so that from our end, we can update the content in uh, the form associated with the access database that feeds the online map. So we have that internally. We also provided the ability for anyone to come to the website, see the map, and be able to access the content in the database to this online um, we'll call it query form, where they could filter information, but then also, more importantly, they can export the entire content or a subset of the content for your own personal use. So in order to also be clear and transparent, uh, we provide information on how the content is updated, the process for that so that it's clear who can provide information and who is allowed to change objectives. So it's been a, a pretty big uh, development stage. It took about three years to just do that one dish objective tool, but it provided uh, the opportunity to address multiple audiences' need, including being able to access the entire database on their own. So now we're going to do a really quick tour of uh, the other to tools we have, uh, starting off with the general public, tool that's still in development, the maps, and then some of the older tools that we've had around uh, that we're still using and, and working on improving over time. So the first tool I want to touch on is one that we're uh, still developing. So the name might change. Currently, it's, it's called the Explore Highlights tool. And this one is going to be targeting definitely just the general public. So it's going to be highlights of information, not a bunch of bar graphs. It's focused on giving them information about the basin as a whole, letting them know what is the council, who are our partners, how do we operate, what are we focused on, as well as giving them ideas of how the program guides mitigation for the hydro system, 
while at the same time uh, assuring that we have reliable and affordable electricity, both of which are uh, mandated by the Power Act. And this tool is going to be relying heavily on videos and photos that council staff have taken that are accessible as uh, you know, free use uh, from the website, Flickr accounts, as well as many of our partners provide us with information, photos, videos. And since we're limiting ourselves in terms of not having too many bar graphs, uh, what we're focusing on for this tool is developing infographics to display the information uh, that relate to the topic. Sources, again, they're mainly from what we can access, council documents, our partners' information. And the, in terms of accessing the data related to this tool, uh, we'll be providing hyperlinks to original sources uh, for anything that we're uh, quoting or relying on. And based on the input we receive from our council members, we'll also uh, provide opportunity to download the infographics that can be used by others for outreach. So the way this tool is looking, although it's still changing, we had a focus group uh, tested out in December last year, and we're going to be updating it from that input and from council member input. It's going to start off that uh, when the person comes to the site, they're so going to see just this top image, uh, the really nice background, the Columbia River Gorge. Then as they either scroll or click to begin, they get brought down to an area where they basically get to pick their own adventure. They can either learn about the topics by topic, which is these picture icons, or by region. And that's again to meet the different audience's needs and desire to explore the content in a different in a manner that meets that matches their interest. Once they pick a topic or a region, uh, they're going to receive um, at first infographic slide deck, slide deck that basically just rotates on its own. Uh, with the focus group, we tried out different types of infographics, and the one you're currently seeing here is what they seem to um, identify with the most. This series of infographics rely heavily on videos or photos as a background, and then numbers that come in and pop up along the way versus you know, the more cartoonish infographic that we're used to seeing. Based on the input we receive, uh, we also tested out different type of information they might want to see associated uh, with a topic, and they basically picked that they preferred to have story maps, um, short little story maps, that would be related to the topic they click. So you might have three or four of them related to the council. And then again, relying heavily on videos and photos and just a bit of text to tell the story quickly. The program resource maps, uh, we started developing those maybe a year ago and we're continuing to develop them. This one is a bit more technical because it focuses more on uh, information that we need at the council to make decision as well as to help our implementers. Uh, right now they're targeting a couple different types of topics. Uh, we have a series of maps that look at the maintenance that is projected to be needed for facilities and lands that have been purchased uh, through the program by Bonneville. And we also use this tool to uh, tell the story about the fish objective like I showed you in the development illustration. We rely a lot on geographic location, again, photos, background information, and then you know, whatever the, the main point of the map was, information about the maintenance need or uh, what objectives exist related to a, a fish species. Data source, again, come from managers, uh, published reports, annual project reports, other tools and databases we can leverage. And currently, uh, the only data access other than viewing is uh, that query tool that we have for um, the FISH objective database. So we have a couple different styles. Uh, the operation and maintenance maps uh, are similar to the one I show you for FISH objective. You click and filter down to what you want to view, and then you get a pop-up, in this case, about the Calspell tribal fish hatchery, some background, a photo, and links to um, uh, council decision letters as well as the maintenance report. Library of objectives, what I showed you recently. Um, you know, you pick what you want to see species-wise. We're currently working on other species right now, so in the near future, probably by the end of this year, you'll be able to come here and you'll see other species like lamprey, bull trout, um, yulicons. And then the other one that we uh, use the SG story map for is to tell a story about a specific topic. Uh, we've used the more traditional layout of the story map for 
the white sturgeon and the toxic contaminant mold. Well, that's redundant, but the toxic pH map. This one, we still, again, this is what you're seeing right now is the pH map, and we still customize the view uh, and the code behind the map so that we could integrate uh, data so that people could like fly through and see where there are hot spots at pHs in the Willamette. It's still pretty more, more dynamic. High level indicator report, we've had that one up for about 10 years. Focuses mainly council members and governors. It's like a highlight of type of actions being implemented through the program and fish status. It draws uh, information and tries to summarize them. Still looking, still using pie charts and bars, so it's not too high up in terms of summary. It relies on uh, our usual data sources, and you're limited to viewing the data table and original data sources, but you can't download. When you come to this site, you start off on the left, which is the entry, entry page, where you get to pick what topic you want to explore. When you pick a topic, then you see a traditional bar graph or line graph, and you can uh, click to expand and, and see the data table or the data sources. In the Subbasin Species Dashboard, that's been, that's been started for almost nine years, but it's still not complete. We're kind of doing it on a limited budget, limited, limited uh, council staff time. So we develop it as we can. The audience for this one was really for the independent science review panel. They review our projects, uh, the projects that are funded by Bonneville, and also for council staff. And basically what this does is try and bring together all the information related to a sub-basin so that our science review panel, when they're reviewing a project, can get a sense of what's going on in that basin, whether it's limiting factors, objective, other entities working there. Again, we leverage what we can, reports, databases, websites of others. Uh, we rely a lot on our Council uh, Fish and Wildlife Program sub-basin plans, as well as a Bonneville project database. And you're limited to viewing the content. The way this one is set up is you first come again, what you see on the left is the entry page, where you can pick a sub-basin or a species, and then it pops up uh, into another page that it basically summarizes the objectives it pulls from a database we created of sub-basin plan objectives. It shows you the limiting factors from the sub-basin plan, organized to match the NOAA ecological concern categories. And then you can click these bars and see more information about projects addressing these uh, limiting factors or type of actions. And the right is the projects that we pull from Bonneville's uh, CB Fish project database. So you can see the type of work happening in that sub-basin. And then we also provide links to external partners that operate in the subbasin, and also provide link to our fish information site so that people can see the focal species listed in the subbasin plan, but then also click and view the status uh, based on the available information that we could find. The fish information site is our oldest site. It was actually started off by um, the managers uh, about, I don't know, uh, over 10 years ago. So we're actually planning on giving it a facelift this year uh, to refresh it and to also um, tweak it so it's a better fit for the audiences. Again, uh, this targets our science panels, council staff, and individuals that want to have more detail about species status and what's going on in their sub-basin. Uh, it focuses on program focal species and program strategies, such as um, predator uh, efforts to control predators. Data types tend to be more bar graphs, maps. Sources are from our, our partners, again, and our project annual reports. We draw a lot from the uh, Fish Passage Center and StreamNet databases. And currently, uh, you're limited to viewing the original sources, but we will be making the graphics and the data exportable uh, when we refresh this tool. Currently, when you come to this tool, uh, you get the entry page, which is the top part. And then you can pick if you want to see the information as a basin-wide summary or explore by province or adult estimates, which is connects directly to StreamNet database for uh, the salmon and steelhead objectives. Or you can explore by focal species. And then when you pop up what you want to look at, you get the bar graph of data. And then you have a small little number at the top that most people miss that connects you to the original data source. So that was quite a lot. Um, so just to wrap it up, I'll share with you a bit what we learned. Uh, the one biggest thing we've learned, especially when developing these ESRI story maps, is you need to check in with your audiences from the get-go and check back with them regularly as you're developing the tool. 
if you really want to make this tool useful for them. Uh, it's easier if you can give them something to react to, even if it's just a PowerPoint mock-up. That kind of gets the creative juices going, and they start giving you some information. But at the same time, you, you need to interpret what they're saying, not just go with what they think, because that's sometimes not what they really need. Uh, you need to be willing to adapt. You know, be willing to change the tool as much as you can to meet your audience's need. Uh, definitely figure out the output first. That's going to help set up your database and how you can program the tool to make it efficient. Plan for independence so that you can maintain it yourself. Uh, seek and leverage the expertise of others. You can build off of them, pull it in, connect via web services. But think wisely about linking, because one thing we've been noticing, uh, we were linking to reports on our partner's website, and as they've been updating their website, the reports have been disappearing. So if you can't afford to have a broken link somewhere, you might want to download a copy so you can be sure uh, to have a stable connection. And as always, it always takes a lot longer than you would expect, as you can see from some of our timelines. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? You may have to unmute yourself if you have a question. I can start off with a question. This is Sharon. I may have been thinking about this for a while. I probably should have added this to the ideas that I wanted people to present. But this really came to the forefront looking at your efforts, Nancy. What resources were necessary to get to this point? And, and that's a question that I would ask of everyone who's presented. I think Chantel is here, and Michelle, uh, Keith, and I think Russell and Brian are here who presented One Fish, Two Fish. And I know that some of you haven't finished. Your, it's still a work in progress for you. But it, these efforts can be massive in terms of money, time, people. So, And I know you may not be able to disclose exactly <laughs> what it takes, but roughly, what kind of resources are necessary? Um, we see the timeline. And then what additional resources do you anticipate needing? Um, yeah, it depends yeah. on the tool. So for example, the white sturgeon tool at the bottom, that was all done internally with council staff time. Uh, so we work closely with our public affairs. Uh, the cost associated with that was, of the white sturgeon tool was, of course, having uh, the Esri uh, license so that we can use the story map template <clears throat> and then council staff. It still took, because we do it amongst other duties, it still took clo close to an hour, uh, an hour. It took close to a year to get the white sturgeon map ready for prime time. So I don't know, you know, we're all salaried, so I don't know <laughs> how would piece of power, You're right. uh, <laughs> the hours for that, but. You definitely have the license and then internal resources. Uh, for fish information site, that one, uh, to maintain it, we have uh, assistance from Bonneville, and it's, it's a, a contract uh, that helps. I think about to maintain the data, because so much of the data on the fish info site is not available from a database anywhere on the web, on, you know, on the basin. We basically have to read reports and extract the data. Uh, that, I think that takes, I think just updating the data is close to um, 25 or 30,000 a year or something like that because it's very manual intensive and that's why the more we can get our partners mm -hmm. making their data accessible the more we'll be able to cut down on that and it's so labor intensive that there's component of the fish info site that we can't update annually so we have some components that we update maybe every three years every four years and try and like juggle things around a bit the sub basin dashboard that was all internally develop again, just like the white sturgeon. That's why that's taking so long. Uh, we kind of do it as we can among a th like three staff that focuses on content. And then we have our one um, webmaster uh, database guy who can help us uh, with the back end. High level indicators, again, that was done internally, same way. Fish program and the program resource map, that one we're sharing. The workload between council staff, uh, we also take in a lot of volunteer from Bonneville staff for especially like uh, getting polygons for the um, lands, uh, a lot of volunteer from the managers to give us the information for fish screen, artificial program, reviewing the content. So there's a lot of volunteering going on, council staff, and then we, for these resource maps, 
and uh, wildlife program, because we associate more priority to these, uh, we also work with a consultant and we do, um, depending on the, on the map, it might be you know, anywhere from 15 to 25,000 or could be multiple steps depending on what the audience audiences request and it's all internal funding so that's why sometimes you know depending on how much money we have internally we might be able to get to phase one of the hatchery map and get that portion live but then we know we want to do some additional refinement based on the audiences so we have to wait a year so that that funding becomes available uh, within the council's internal budget so like yeah it's a balancing act it's trying to figure out how you can leverage volunteer accessible tools connect to information and the more we can have regional databases or regional or entity wide uh, era databases that we can connect to the easier it is for us to um, develop these tools so the work that's been done with the managers through streamnet and coordinate assessment I mean that just that removed a, a large portion of the workload we had on the fish information site for gathering available data for adult salmon steelhead so you know, that then frees up some of our workloads so we can uh, focus on other aspects of the fish information site. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's labor intensive for sure. Yeah, do you see that if you were able to have a data flow that included APIs, it would free up a lot of your time? You said you had to manually enter a lot of the content, the data. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but the, the trick is find the data, though. Uh, so, a lot of our partners don't necessarily have the data in a manner yet that's mm -hmm. accessible. So a lot of the resident fish species, we have a hard time getting that or the hatchery uh, release information. But as we see um, improvements on our partners level and then the regional databases level, that definitely frees up a lot of information and reduces the redundancy of having someone, you know, to retype it in again because it was given sure. to us in a typed up report. So, right. Yeah. Can, I, can, I just, mm -hmm. can I just interject here for a second? This is Chris over at StreamNet. Um, I think you all bring up a really good point. We've attempted to move into the automation realm and several other species through coordinated assessments, and that's still the goal of the project. But it's been resource limited with the focus being on salmon and steelhead, but that's been our intent all along to build sort of a database for resident species, hatchery, fish, sturgeon, et cetera, that would feed into things like the council's websites via API. So we could replicate mm -hmm. what we do with salmon and steelhead if we had the resources. Yep. Hey, this is Evan from IDFG. Um, yeah, Chris and Nancy, um, they hit the nail right on the head and it all speaks to compiling once and publishing a thousand times and not reinventing the wheel and ending up with different answers to the same question. So yeah, a way to use the uh, feedback loop in the development and the web services to leverage the existing data sources. Well done. And definitely if anyone sees a topic that we have and that you know some database that I don't know about, you know, feel free to let me know because the more we can continue leveraging and connecting, the better it is. Well, this is a great set of tools. Thank you, Nancy, for your presentation. Any more questions for Nancy or discussion about, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear what people think, uh, people who are involved in developing these kinds of data visualizations, um, people who've presented before, if you have similar problems or lessons learned. Yeah, hey, um, this is Audrey. I have a question um, about one of your lessons learned. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could talk, just uh, maybe expand just a little bit um, about that very first, that's it, the um, kind of a check in with audiences early and regularly and often. Um, I think that that is a really important one. I just wondered if you could, like, do you find that bringing specific you know options to people you know how do you frame the questions when you mm -hmm. check in with folk and, and you do it kind of just like during existing you know meetings or venues and that kind of thing if you could just talk about that a little bit that'd be I would, I would yeah, like to definitely definitely 
So the one thing we've learned about that is we want something from them and they don't necessarily want us to give us, they don't necessarily want to give us their time. <laughs> so we try to be as flexible as we can <laughs> in terms of uh, making it easy on them uh, to provide their input. So yes, the first is um, definitely has something for them to react to. So even though we can be completely wrong in the first mock-up, um, and actually, it's kind of good to be completely wrong in the first mock-up because then that really gets them over that shyness and and uh, start providing input. And frequently, uh, there'll be myself and uh, the person that helped me develop uh, the mock-up coming along, and then we'll actually sort of attack our own mock-up <laughs> to try and get them talking. Because a lot of time, uh, we'll show up and they're they're kind of a bit hesitant to look at something you mocked up on a PowerPoint and start nitpicking and offering up an idea that's completely out of left field. So it, I usually try to plan a minimum of an hour and a half, um, depending uh, on the stage. <clears throat> I might actually do a lot of traveling myself or set up a lot of individual um, webinar with smaller subgroup of people. So that's a bit more of a safe environment where they can chat informally with me. And we'll do it, preferably I try and do it in person because then I can gauge also um, how they're reacting behaviorally to certain things. You can see them, you know, starting to react to something, but they might not voice it yet. So then you can start teasing it out of them. <clears throat> so it's a lot of work on your part. You you need to be the one that tries and put the majority of the burden on yourself, develop that mock-up, and make it easy for them to provide that input either by going to them, offering a webinar, or um, you know, other ways to provide that input informally so that, you know, and, and don't criticize anything they say either. Uh, early on, I try and encourage them to think as broadly as they can <clears throat> and not try and, 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 you know, veto anything they say right off the back because often the same idea will pop up and then I'll realize, oh, they're saying this, but they really mean that. And then we can work uh, with that input. The other thing I tried, though, for uh, the general public one, since I don't have as easy access uh, to the general public, it's a bit easier for me to get input from managers and our project sponsors and our council members. But for the uh, um, general one, the pilot highlight that we're still working on, that one I actually held a focus group. So I, I tried to find uh, people that were neighbors of people that we work with, um, people that represented the elect, you know, the electrical component, the electricity ratepayers folks as well as folks that I thought were newer to our program, may not know uh, the program too uh, too well. And I actually invited them all to come for, um, I think it was a three hour session at the council, and basically you know, broke up into smaller groups and had them testing out the tool and, and having like a real focus group testing. So I, I try to be as flexible because I'm the one that needs this information. So I try and be as flexible as my, my audience uh, requires. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. That's that is really helpful, and that was uh, one of my follow-ups. Was kind of like when you do, you know, these kind of focus groups and and um, informal check-ins and that kind of thing. Like, do you, it sounds like you do? Um, maybe you identify some new or additional or larger audiences than you even originally anticipated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cool. Especially when that tool is going to be targeting a broader audience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I can speak to that. I'm Sharon here. I can speak to that a little bit. I was in one of the focus groups <laughs> in Nancy's <laughs> latest focus group, um, the one I think for the lay people, but there was a good mix of people. There were some senior fish biologists in the group. Um, there were some people who hadn't ever thought about fish, and I think the mix of uh, people in the group was was good. We learned from each other. We provided input that we may not have provided had we not heard input from different groups of people. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that for that particular group, anyway, it was it was a good mix of people. And I don't know what the outcome was as far as how useful we were, but <laughs> but um, it was it was a really interesting way yeah. to give feedback yeah yeah it was very helpful and it actually made us realize wow you can't 
you know, expect people to be able to figure out this aspect of the site because they're all tripping up on it, even though, you know, those mm -hmm. of us who live and breathe on the internet and on the computer would never realize it was a hiccup. So. Mm -hmm. Right, so more questions for Nancy or for each other. I do want to thank Nancy for this presentation and the uh, very comprehensive work that they've been doing. Uh, this is Keith from the Governor's Salmon Office. Thank you, Nancy. My pleasure. And again, feel free if you come across something with one of our tools, something broken or something you can't figure out or an idea to improve it, I'm always open to hearing those. All right. So unless there's more discussion about what we'd like to do, I think um, my plan was just to continue uh, what we're doing and have more presentations. And I've contacted about uh, eight more people. Um, the next person up is John Arterburn from the Colville Tribes. He's said that he would like to do, he'd love to do a July presentation. That leads me to discuss meetings. I, I hate to do a poll about a poll, but I might have to because there are a lot of us who aren't here. Do polls, we're getting so many of them, and uh, we had a suggestion to have a standing meeting time since this is a monthly meeting. And I have emailed you a few times about that. What do you guys think about having a standing meeting time, say, third Thursdays or second Thursdays of the month? so that we could more easily schedule people. You would have it on your calendar. Any thoughts about that? I'd second that. Good idea. Yep. Yeah, good to know. All right, then what I might do, instead of sending out a doodle poll for July, I'll send out a little short note that says, do you like second Thursdays, third Thursdays? And I know that some people might have conflicts. And the reason I say Thursdays is because there are people, whole agencies that don't work on Fridays that work for 10. And I wanted to ask a question too. Uh, there, there are quite a few of us who could still present about fish biology, fish habitat, habitat in general, riparian habitats. What do you think about getting presentations from other fields entirely? I have a lead on at least a couple people who could present really different data visualizations. And maybe again, this is a poll for the group that I can send out as an email. Um, but any thoughts about that? Uh, this is Brian. I think that would be a good idea uh, for, um, from terms of just generating ideas, because that's part of what this group's about is, is trying to spur thinking, spur, you know, look at, at different ways people are doing things. And, and sometimes something completely off field really um, gives you an insight, you know, aha, we could, you know, I could do something like that with uh, with something related to what I'm doing. Um, so I think that'd be that'd be worth doing. You know, it, it doesn't have to be every time, but you know, every other mm -hmm. month or something. Like that, you could bring in somebody from outside. Sharon, I had a, a different idea, maybe that we might want to talk about for the future, and it occurred to me from Nancy's experience, maybe growing this group. Going forward, we could serve as sort of the focus group for somebody who's developing a website, if people are interested in that, and use some of the experiences we've all had to provide feedback. It's just a thought, but if somebody's in the development process and wants to run an in-progress site by people and ask for feedback, it might be a useful use of this group's time. I second that. Second. This is Nancy. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea. I think it would benefit both the people who are developing a site and people in the group who are thinking about what a site might be for them or what kind of data and audiences they might need to visualize. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So offer our services, right, to the focus group? Yeah. Any other thoughts about other directions for the group or presentations from other places, regions, fields? And I know, you know, you don't have to come up with it off the top of your head. Anytime you can email me and I'll start compiling information. And if it's a resource, I'll put it in our resource document. If it's an idea for a presentation or a different field, that would be good too. So it sounds good. And yeah, any other thoughts about data visualization? I would encourage you to look at the Community for Data Integration 
website. There's just so much information there, not only about data visualization, but management, data repositories, data accessibility, and many things, data. So if everybody has expressed what they'd like to, we can call it. Thank you very much for helping facilitate this discussion. Yep, All right. thank you. Th th thanks to Nancy and thanks to Megan Detloff, who really helped this particular meeting happen. And thank you to everybody who's here and for your participation. That was great. Thank you. Thank you much. Happy Friday. Thanks, thanks. Have a good weekend.